Well, you can call us the 2020 F1 calendar because we're going back to Bahrain for a second helping. Let's get started. And they are going to win! Pierre Gasly wins the Italian Grand Prix! Three cars going wheel to wheel as Perez is caught by Charles Leclerc and his three cars gone off. It's a DNF for MAX. The world championship record is equals. Lewis Hamilton, seven-time champion of the world. So we are now rejoined by Angus. Uh, Liv is not here with us in this episode. Myself and uh, uh, and Tristan remain as always. But um, Angus, we, we didn't actually hear your thoughts uh, last week about the Bahrain Grand Prix. Um, what do you think in a sort of nutshell of, of what happened? What a start to the season. It was it was amazing. It was I was trying to rack my brains and think of the last time there was an opening race which was that good. And I genuinely can't think of an opening race, opening race of the season which has been that good in that yeah great but the midfield battle was as always phenomenal we know Formula 1 has got that potential but we had the battle at the front that we so wanted Hamilton versus Verstappen I don't even all these people who who, who if they're saying oh it's such a disappointment that it ended up the way it did yes admittedly Max did bottle it a little bit he had the faster car he had the faster tyres at the end um, really weird bit at the end where he when he let Lewis back on the straight and then he's almost got straight back into the dirty air and then I mean because he's he's lost the car mm. um, and so from then he did, didn't didn't get the momentum back because he still had what three or four laps to go to get to get the move done mm. um, which was strange but no I still th- I mean it was still a great battle like it's still just and I was on the edge of my seat for most of the race I thought it was it was fantastic that we we finally we've been crying out for years for a genuine wheel-to-wheel battle at the start of the season between, well, for, at least for the last couple of seasons, we've been wanting one between Mercedes and Red Bull and Hamilton v Verstappen. It's got serious vibes of, I was looking back through my F1 history of the, I mean, I wasn't old enough to uh, quite catch this period of F1 history, but there's a period in the mid 2000s where you had Schumacher versus Alonso. And this was Schumacher right at the end of his career, just won his seventh title. And you had Alonso who hadn't won a title yet and those two were battling out for the World Championship. And this has got serious vibes of that. You've got Hamilton, of course, the veteran versus Verstappen, who, to be fair, is in his seventh year in the sport, but he is the relative, like, sort of in- inexperienced one and the one who hasn't got that title. It's got serious vibes of that. And I think if that's the season ahead that we have, I think it honestly could be a classic. And that might just have cursed it, but <laughs> let's, let's, hope, let's hope not. It, it's, set, it's set up to be a barnstormer, well, if I'm honest. Y- you say that, but uh, when we're casting our minds back, so I had this thought after the last podcast, because I, I don't want to cover too much of what we spoke about last time, so there's not too much overlap. So I'm, intri- I'm interested by that last thought you had there, along with the whole Max bottled it thing. I think we should explore that in a minute without also contradicting ourselves from last week too much. But um, do you remember in 2018, we had that cracking sort of optimistic opener in Australia? God, Australia is the opener. Oh, wow, long time ago now. And uh, Sebastian Vettel won. And everyone went, this is it. This is the Ferrari versus Mercedes extravaganza year. This is the time when Vettel takes on Hamilton. And... Well, with with glorious hindsight, we now know that Hamilton won and Vettel came in in second. In fact, um, it was a you know a year where Vettel bottled it over and over again, um, and it was a real disappointment. So, is there a little bit of concern in your mind that we're going to have exactly the same thing this year? Uh <clears throat> oh, I hope I really hope not. But it, it's actually you you make a good point there. It's interesting the the parallels with that year in that that year Ferrari had the genuinely faster car for mm-hmm. the vast vast majority of the year, and Vettel should have won that championship. Red Bull at the moment have got the fastest car. Um, I mean, lest you forget, Max put it on pole by four tenths. Yeah, like, that's a that's a big and caught up with him twice from eight seconds yes. back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Like if if Hamilton had been on pole by four tenths, we'd be like, oh my god, Mercedes are dominating. <laughs> yeah. But Max has put it on pole by four tenths. Admittedly, it's the start of the season, and that gap you you'd think would close because Mercedes as a competitor are just so relentless. But yeah, they actually they have the fastest car and. I, you always hope that they don't do what Ferrari did and just and bottle the championship um, because they've 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 got themselves in a great position right now. They've got a, a rapid piece of equipment underneath the drivers, um, and yeah, it'd be interesting to see how that 
how that develops. Of course, to be fair, we might be sitting here in six months' time and Mercedes have completely overhauled the deficit. Um, but <laughs> it's not beyond them. <laughs> no. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's the kind of it's the kind of relentless relentlessness that they're they're used to. We might turn up at Imola in two weeks' time and the gaps are a lot closer because they've had the three week break to work on it. But no, it's um, I I hope it doesn't. As much as I'd love to see Hamilton like officially cement himself as the greatest, because in all likelihood this year he probably will pass that 100 pole mark, pass the 100 win mark and get the 8th title. That still is probably the, the fair bet. But I would also just, just to have Verstappen just upset the apple cart, um, you know, have a, have a different world champion. Have a new world... It would be a, a new world champion for the first time since Rosberg, which feels oh, like... Don't, a, don't say five stuff like years. that. Five yeah, it feels like years. ages ago now. It feels like ages ago now. There's only... Yeah, so... I, yeah, I think it'd be fantastic if that's happened. But yeah, I'd like him to do it without, you know, with, with a bit of a fight. It's a bit, mm. a bit like a walk in the park. If he just gets to the end, it's like, oh look, this is my world championship, and everyone else is miles behind him in the standings. I just want there to be a fight. It does the, mm. it will be difficult for Red Bull to win, especially as currently they are only fighting with Max, and this is perhaps why Perez is going to be so important this year. In fact, to some extent, Perez is going to be the most analysed driver on the grid because he knows that for there to be a championship fight, he has to be behind Max and challenging Bottas. Fourth is minimum, really, yeah. Fourth is the minimum now. And this this is make or break time for Red Bull. This is the closest they're going to be to the Mercedes without knowing the what what sort of upsets next year's cars are going to bring with the entire overhaul of the rules so yeah. yeah perez is in the in unenviable position to being the probably what do you think the most important driver except think, for lewis hamilton i think he's definitely the deciding factor um because now it's always been that issue of max is there that's awesome but then there's two mercedes for him to get past in many ways this season does it reminds me a bit of 2019 insofar that, okay, Ferrari were the team then, um, but um, Red Bull were fastest in testing, uh, and now they've almost taken on that sort of um, optimism or potential, shall we say, and they've taken it to Mercedes in the first race. But compare that to, compare the two drivers from Red Bull to the two drivers from Ferrari in 2019, both of them seem to be firing on all, on all cylinders. So you have not only as testing would have it, the the best car, but two of the best drivers on form, it makes you think that this season could be even better or even closer than 2019 could have been because we all know that Ferrari should have probably won that championship, be that um, the drivers or constructors, because they had the best kit. But when you have two well-established drivers, be it one in the sort of Red Bull team and one in the sport more generally, it gives you hope that that battle that we never had um, we could have moving forwards. And even better when you consider that there's nothing to insinuate thus far, and I must state thus far, that um, uh, Red Bull or Mercedes um, have cars which uh, violate the rules, as um, Ferrari famously did uh, two years ago. But um, I, it, it does give me, give me that vibe because of because of the two drivers, I think, in, a, in the Red Bull cars. And let's not forget the Red Bull strategy is going to have to be in point as well. Mm. Mercedes is infamous in their ability to analyse what's going on, on the track and Bahrain it just did not do they yeah. they did I think well personally I think they are the ones if, if one is to blame anyone <laughs> um, I know we're blown no blame culture but I, I, I would say that the strategy let down Max a little bit and I think when I was fresh out of it last week I said that it, you know Max wanted to be left alone and they didn't pit him for new tyres and I again I I still hold on to the belief that Red Bull just weren't ready and they were sitting on their hands a little bit expecting Mercedes not to come back at them and I I don't think it's 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 like that I think that I think they I think they were wi- they were willing to bet that Max would stay out longer and would be faster on the older tyres and he just wasn't so I think they've really got to step up their game because Part of the reason why Vettel didn't win in 2018 was the poor Ferrari strategy. In fact, <laughs> Ferrari, I, I, I enjoy the <laughs> fact that this year Ferrari is still carrying on their classic uh, strategy technique of, of consulting the magic eight ball before they uh, pit one of their drivers. It's shaking, <laughs> shaking it. Should we come in? 
oh, all signs point to a yes, you know, that sort of thing. So I think Red Bull this year are really going to have to step up their, their, their game and, and maybe invest in a Ouija board if they get really stuck. So with us having a second episode dedicated to the season opener of 2021, we would be remiss not to go and talk about the uh, proverbial elephant on the track, shall we say. Track limits at turn four. There was a lot of ambiguity and lack of clarity that both Toto Wolf and Christian Horner touched upon there, where essentially races were allowed to exceed track limits when they were not involved in a battle. But when they were involved in a battle, um, track limits were very, very tight and anyone who went over uh, the, the sort of line at turn four would be punished severely as Max Verstappen found out. Uh, what do we think about this sort of Mm, flip-flopping shall we say from the FIA regarding turn four and the the limits or lack of them it's an interesting topic it's kind of I feel feel, to be honest it feels like years now that traffic track limits has been a thing or has been talked about it feels like it's it's always brought up at some point over the course of a Formula One season Um, so yeah the controversy in this one was I think that They'd been like they'd been told not to use to basically take the mick with track limits on the outside of turn four because at the end of the day they were taking a line if they were going over the track limits they were taking a line which obviously was going to be faster you'd have less of a less of an acute angle to take both into and coming out the corner and therefore your exit speed and also your entry speed could be faster so so that so that ended up being quite a key point in that Hamilton. Late in the race, when his tires were were quite a bit older than Verstappen's, and Verstappen was closing on fresher tires, the Hamilton needed every like bit of advantage that he could get to try and keep the gap or to try and keep the lead. And and it, in the end, it basically got to the point I think where like Red Bull said to Verstappen, "Well, Hamilton's doing this, which isn't completely legal, so you do it as well." Um, and then, of course, you had at the end of the race, Verstappen's done almost a brilliant move around the outside. But he's gone over the track limit now. I remember thinking at the time, uh, I did, like the, my first thought wasn't like oh track limits because I was focused because I was like as a fan viewing it and I was like oh it's a fantastic move. But then yeah, he's given he's given it straight back afterwards, given the position straight back. And I don't know. I mean, you could probably probably tell from me talking about it. It's just a bit confusing, really. It's just there just yeah. needs to, I, I just, there just needs, just needs to be clarity. I get that Verstappen gave the position back because if if he hadn't, then. There would have been a whole like hullabaloo about like oh he's taking the position off the track and he's overtaking like that's an unfair advantage, um, but I think the fact that there was confusion I think the fact Hamilton came on the radio and wasn't sure himself about the about the rules and was asking about them, um, I don't think you know there's there's great confidence there I think I, I think it just needs to be more clarity because it shouldn't be the main talking point of a brilliant race shouldn't be the track limits it should be the actual racing itself so. I, I don't know, I just fit, perhaps just needs to be more clarification, to be honest. Well, currently, track limits in Formula 1 is, is sort of 50 shades of grey. And I suppose it's it, it, in terms of other sports, it kind of reminds me a little bit of the offside rule and how mm. the offside rule is a very clear-cut line in which you, you, you know, which, which their referees in, in football will look at. And in my mind, track limits should be the same thing. If you cross that line, that is it. You're over the track limits and there should be a, a resulting penalty. Or alternatively, you, you just say that you can go across turn limits and you can take as wide a corner as you'd like. At, at some point, the extra distance you travel equalises the extra speed you can turn in. So there will be a natural line of... Uh, diminishing returns Mm. the the ambiguity is is in this section in in the the sporting regulations it says should a car leave the track the driver may rejoin however this only this may only be done when it is safe to do so and without gaining any lasting advantage so it's in that unspecific terminology that this problem has come about right because when Hamilton was in the lead and he was he went over the track limits 29 times I think someone counted yeah, that yeah. Um, thank you for counting it I didn't have the time <laughs> to do it <laughs> <laughs> if you if you gain a tenth of a second each time you go 20 each time you go off the track well then by the time you've added those up you've added on 2.9 seconds 
you gained an advantage of 2.9 seconds, which to me says a lasting advantage. So it, it seems bizarre that Hamilton was allowed to go over the track limits 29 times. And I'm not saying he did gain 2.9 seconds, but when Verstappen's only five or six seconds behind, even a fifth of a second is a tenth of his time between them. So it is certainly a lasting advantage. And so I think it should just be a clear cut thing. If you go over the white line, all four wheels go over the white line, you get a mark against your name. If you do it three times, then you've gone off the track three times, you get a black and white flag, and then one Mm -hmm. more after that and you get a penalty. Simple as. That's it. Yeah. It should be as simple <laughs> as simple as the offside rule. We should print it on the back of some <laughs> sort of commemorative 50p, 50 pence piece in the UK as we did with the rule. But <laughs> maybe, am I just oversimplifying it though? Uh, no, I, I, I do think you're right. Like it's, it's got to the point where I think Toto Wolf summed it up perfectly where he said the rules of F1 should not be like a Shakespearean play where it can be interpreted in one direction or the other. And that's exactly where we are at the moment because um, I believe the teams and drivers were told by the FIA we won't be monitoring you during the race so you can technically exceed track limits and not be punished for it per se. So Mercedes took that as fine, okay, we'll run wide at turn four, we'll get a sort of better entrance and exit to that corner and as you say, gain some uh, some possible time on our on our rivals but when you've got them taking advantage of that and then red bull being like we're going to play by the rules so to speak and not exceed those limits and then going well hang on we'll do it as well it does tend to leave a bit of a a bitter taste in my mouth at least like don't get me wrong it didn't spoil the sport it didn't spoil the race um but it did leave a bit of a hmm that's not quite cricket um sort of taste in my brain if you will um so so yeah um there does need to be more clarity i think uh, michael massey is going to uh, come forward with some more clarity on that but um it seems like the fi have almost been caught short in many ways they've not seen a somewhat obvious um uh, ambiguity or or dispute that could have arisen or did ar- did arise uh, during this race and um, it's not made them look too good but uh, I agree more clarity is definitely needed but I'd hate to be the guy to uh, to make that uh, decision of uh, line stops here and starts there but uh, I suppose that's what the uh, what the pros are paid for yeah I was going to say Tristan don't even start on the offside rule in football that's a whole other right now <laughs> right now with um the offsides being decided by like armpits and that are we going to get to the point where um we're going to have um like track limits decisions in formula one decided by driver's armpits or racing no, suits or, uh, or stuff like that yeah it's, it, it, it the might... nice thing about a tire is the tire is the widest part of the of the car so you just say as soon as as soon as 100 percent of the car goes over the white line in, but in, they do actually specify what the white line is so the white line itself does count as the track, which is why... So you could be a a micron touching the white um, and you will you will be in track limits. So we do have real defined aspects of the track and the car and that would solve a whole load of problems. And it's it's not like we don't, we don't do these other track limit things. For example, the pit limiter. Mm. You know that as soon as you cross that white line you have to be at 50 kilometers an hour or 60 kilometers an hour whatever the the the, the limiter is and so we're very used in, for, in, in to in formula 1 looking at a white line and seeing if someone's crossed it or not at a at a given moment and i, I think one of the resolutions to the problem we had at the Bahrain Grand Prix is to maybe add like a clause in um if you don't want to stop drivers going over the white line which is if you exceed the white line four times you are not allowed to start moaning when other people use the white lines against you so for example Mm -hmm. Hamilton went over it 29 times Verstappen has every right to use the white line over and take overtake Hamilton because Hamilton was over the white lines anyway so if you cross the white lines the drivers the driver suddenly dictates to everyone that they're they're willing to accept that the white lines no longer dictate the barriers of the of the track so what the hell max can go around it right that that's fine but that's Mm. also a bit silly 
So it just should be the white line is the track limit. What's the point of having a track limit if it doesn't limit? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you, you know also what, what annoys me sometimes. I swear it's been the case on multiple occasions where you get to a track and they give they give exemptions for some corners. Like some corners, they they just they just like oh you know what they're pushing so hard on that one. I need it away that will just give them the benefit of the doubt. There used to be one. Yeah. So I've seen. Um, I don't think it's the case anymore. But if you go back, so this is this is incredibly niche. But so so red, so so the so Red Bull Ring, when they when they used to have the race in like the two thousand the early two thousands, cars used to like literally just take the absolute mick with turn one. So you know how turn one is a bit of runoff. The Red Bull Ring. It does. Yep. Yes. Yes. The drivers, if you go back and watch like qualifying laps from that time. Drivers literally used to just run wide because they just go in deliberately fast, run wide because it was tarmac, and then just continue with their lap. Then mm. I feel like there you get the odd corner now and then where there's like exceptions and where they just they halfway through the weekend they just they just they're just like oh fine just go whatever there they just there just needs to be consistency to be honest just like you can't say with you can't say with some corners either you, either you look at the whole track and you say right go wild. Or you look at each corner, you have track limits, and you say, oh, you can't go off, like you can't go over the white line. I think it just needs to be consistency, really. That's all we ask for. And what what yeah. even is a lasting advantage? Because in, in <laughs> we, we're talking yeah. about a sport where the difference between first and third can be hundredths of a second. Any so if you gain a hundredth of a second in by by going out of the track limits in during a race, then you've already exceeded the dis the time between maybe a third place and first place during qualifying. Which is mm. why in qualifying you can't exceed track limits. Formula yeah. One acknowledged the fact that for that you get a lasting advantage, but until the race, like I get for the first court when a race starts and it's the first corner and everyone's pummeling their way through the pack the the pack trying to get through i get that you might say well we'll ignore it for turn one and turn you know or the first lap but once yeah. once everyone's gone into their their usual sort of single filed order with mercedes at the front and Haas at the back then it should then activate you know if you'd like the track limits are now activating like drs for example i mean technically in extremis a lasting advantage let's say okay Let's say Lewis Hamilton wins the Drivers' Championship and it comes down to a handful of points between first and second, uh, second being Max Verstappen. Because Hamilton's won that race and run wide 29 times, technically he's got a lasting advantage from that race. So technically, in the most extreme circumstances, if those events were to happen, he should be stripped of his uh, eighth championship, according to the rules. According in in F one, a tenth of a second can lead to a world championship because of the domino effect across the entire season. It's hard to make back the seven points between first and second across a season sometimes, especially a season that's really close. Look at uh, Hunt versus Louder. They were, they were always mm. crossing over and and getting really close to each other uh, in, in terms of points, in terms of uh, <laughs> phys- physicalness. They detest each other at the time. So. <laughs> It makes all the difference in a sport that's about speed and precision. And it's annoying that we're talking about uh, something so stupid that should be so easy to fix. Because, as I say, speed and precision. We've got Mm. speed. We haven't got precision. Yeah. I mean, when those events naturally do unfold, I'll be showing this to the FIA and saying, Oi. Told you so. I told you so. I told you so. Lasting advantage. (laughs) But yes, uh, aside from Lewis Hamilton exceeding track limits, who were the other winners uh, in your your guys' mind, who do you think really sort of shone and stood out? Um, someone you perhaps expected or didn't expect, or um, yeah, what do you think? Yeah, well, briefly touch on Mazepin. Um, I will say, yeah, I, well, we will reiterate whilst whilst we do dislike him and his conduct, it was it was good to see at least he was okay from his accident, um, which mm. was I reiterate Liv's point yeah, from last week. I think that. Um, at least he like that's the main important thing that he was okay, and then we could laugh at how he spun off after three corners. Um, mm. Also, also, just like to mention, uh, give a mention to how in qualifying, he um, there's like a, a um, what you call it, like a decorum that no one like overtakes um, each other on the outlaps on the final corner. So what he chose to do was just uh, just raz past everyone. <laughs> 
um, at the final corner and then proceed to f- spin at the first corner <laughs> and then mess up. Hence why Vettel and Ocon, I think, got knocked out. So that's, um, I mean, it's, it's uh, you couldn't write it, honestly. On, yeah, but, oh, uh, so on better news. Sonoda, yes. Um First of all, I'd I'd like I'd like to uh, point out the 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 depressing feeling that came across me when I re- realised that Yuki Tsunoda is born in May two thousand. So he is the first F one driver born in the twenty first century. That makes him three hundred and sixty seven days younger than myself, um, which is quite, <laughs> just over just over just over a year younger than myself, which is which is great. Um, I like the <laughs> uh, but, yeah, no, but on a, on a, on a serious note, like honestly, fantastic performance. I I think what I I I rated from his we over a weekend. I you you definitely saw some like aspects of inexperience. For example, I feel like his Q like in in Q one he smashed it, came like second or something or third, like put in a phenomenal time. To which point we were like, oh my god, these Alpha Tauris are quick. To which they are, to be fair. And in Q2, I think, I don't know whether it was any experience or whether um, like he got it wrong with sort of using his tyres up too early or going too hell for leather. But qualifying in 13th, especially with um, Pierre Gasly up in 5th, definitely was, a, was an underperformance by Sonoda, which was disappointing. However... Has to be commended how he came back in the race. Um, I think he, he also, he made quite a poor start. He started 13th and he dropped down to like 16th or 17th. Um, but from that, he came back. He did some brilliant moves. Um, overtook Fernando Alonso and Kimi Raikkonen. Not many people can say they've overtaken two world champions on their Formula 1 debut. Um, so that was something pretty cool. Um, but yeah, like... The overall a very strong performance to come from low down in the field to to nab some points on his F1 debut. I've got to say, it's uh, that Alpha Tauri is bloody quick. Um, it's and, so and fast. yeah, it's actually so yeah. quick. It's probably I did my little preseason predictions. I think I put them fifth in the constructors because their car is actually quick. Like it's it's on a level with like with the Ferrari. It's just behind the McLaren, you'd say. But at the moment, it's definitely got the. It's definitely got the um, the head start on Aston Martin and Alpine. It's it's a quick yeah. car, so I think this might not be the last time we're talking about um, a strong performance from Sonoda because that car definitely looks worthy of points like consistently. Mm-hmm. Have you got them in your F1 fantasy team? I have Gasly. I've got I think. Gasly as well. Yeah, so I, I think put, yeah. I picked Sonoda, which I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I'm sort of smug because. Gasly went out, but when Gasly was in fourth, I was like, "Oh no, I picked the wrong one." Um, so it, it this is a great moment to plug our uh, F1 fantasy. There is a link in the description and a code, just in case the link doesn't work, to our F1 fantasy, where you can follow us or you can join in. Actually, you can join in. Please join. Or, uh, you can also find our social media down there as well, where you can see what we're up to, what we're talking about as well. Uh, veterans of F1 in review will remember how sceptical I was about the rumours and confirmation that Alpha Tauri would be um, deposing of um, Daniel Kvyat and replacing him with a young Yuki Shinoda, uh, younger than myself in fact as well. Um, but it seems that I'm being forced on this season opener to eat some humble pie as well. Two points uh, on your first race weekend, that's pretty decent. Um, granted, we've still got a long season to go and the sort of inexperience and, and green nature of Yuki will no doubt come out, but it's a very good first impression. And looking at him and Gasly, we know how good Gasly is from last season. If it wasn't for that incident in the first few corners of lap one, I've no doubt he would have scored points as well. Um, so it looks like a very, very feisty lineup. And I think they will push Ferrari all the way. But um, if I can seamlessly segue now into my other winners uh, from that uh, from that Grand Prix, I think Ferrari did very well, relatively speaking. Granted, they're not up there um, winning races and fighting for the championship as the Tifosi, uh, no doubt, fans of Ferrari more generally would love to uh, see them do. But um, but yes, Charles Leclerc was. 
amazing, quite frankly. Qualified in fourth with that Ferrari car, uh, ahead of two uh, McLarens, which there's no doubt McLaren has a faster car, and two Aston Martins who beat them last time uh, in the form of racing points in the Constructors' Championship. So, um, yes, a very strong uh, sort of season opener from him, converted that into a sixth place, and then, you know, w- what a change it can make having Carlos Sainz as your, uh, I suppose, second driver, uh, if if there are rankings in Ferrari, I'm sure there are. Um, eighth, qualified in eighth, finish in eighth, points finish, pretty decent. So um, yeah, I think last year there was the the big threat of Alpha Tauri uh, leapfrogging Ferrari, and it really really being a sort of seas of hell akin to the 1980s that we saw. But um, I'm I'm fairly confident that Ferrari will have a good season this year. Uh, certainly a better one than last year, but um. Maybe not as good as um, as McLaren, but uh, do, you, yeah. do you think Progress. do you think Alpha Tauri will beat Ferrari? No, no, I don't. I don't think that. No. Liv did predict that at the beginning. She did. She did. Um, but I mean, well, it's it's you know, it's only week one. Like Ferrari could show some serious. Uh, reliability issues or just pace issues more generally so um you can't rule it out but i think on on the sort of current trend we're looking at i think ferrari will will be okay i think that'll yeah be yeah i've gone with ferrari fourth in my predictions and alpha tari fifth i think i, I think alpha tari have got enough to beat Good aston man. martin and alpine but then again this is just based on like the start of the season so like like we said there's 23 races that's a long season a lot could change in that time I will, I will say I based on my prediction history cuz so um basically so I made uh, Tom will understand this and I made a football predictions uh list before this season started and I put um I put Aston Villa to go down this year so maybe my predictions are not so uh Ouch. not so Ouch. good we'll, we'll we'll see we'll see, we'll see about that but um if my F1 predictions are as as off as those ones it could be it could be interesting and for those racing fanatics out there they'll know that extreme e happened i believe on was it sunday right well yeah it qualifying was on saturday so the the, the few rounds of qualifying on saturday and then the race on sunday the times were all off for me though they, they, mm. they were early about 10 o'clock i think i can't really yeah. remember i just I, I set an alarm i was like ah kind of watch <laughs> <laughs> i know <laughs> Yeah, so this took place in the Saudi Arabian desert, uh, mm. Desert X uh, Prix, I think it's called, and um, there was teams from Nico Rosberg, teams from Lewis Hamilton, Jensen Button. Um, what do we think, Carlos Sainz, junior as well, senior, oh, one of them, um, the Carlos Sainz family? Uh, what do we think though about Extreme? E? Were we fans, not fans? Would we watch it again? Would we leave it neutral? What do we think? So can I can I uh, start and uh, I could also read you Liv's comments because she had some comments as well. So if you were if you followed the Formula One in review Twitter, we we did tweet out some stuff about it. Personally, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was fantastic to watch them going up and down the sort of the ridges. The the extreme thing about it is how <laughs> difficult it is. You have to say it every time. Uh, how <laughs> difficult it is to, to race there. And they are going up these extreme ridges and then onto the extreme top of like a hill and then going down this extreme <laughs> dip, um, which is about like a hundred meter drop and stuff. So, and the the first person to do qualifying set a lap. Um, I'm really sorry. I can't remember names because these are all unfamiliar names to me. So uh, I've already got the Formula One's names in my head. I can't. I can't fit more stuff in because, it's like Homer Simpson, <laughs> if I put another name in, another one falls out, and then I won't remember who Valtteri Bottas is. Anyway, <laughs> so first lap, uh, they go on top of this like ridge, and then they nearly fall off the side of it, and you can hear the the, the car going trying to get back on. It's it's so cool. It really is really cool. Uh, to some extent, qualifying was more of a spectacle than than the race because you know, they were like go, and then all three cars would like shoot off, and then one of them would use their like booster button, and they would go flying off to the lead, and then then the the dust would get kicked up, and then completely cover the cars behind. Mm. So uh, you were like, oh yeah, look look, that one's in the lead, and uh, where are the other two cars? So um, at the, the race was like a a, a, a three. Uh, like three cars in a row and then they they only race three cars at a time uh the there was a gigantic clash from uh from uh claudia hergen who mm. was flipping away in the sand we had drivers 
rear-ending other drivers because they couldn't get grip in the in the, the hostile environment. It was just really, really cool. The takeaways for me, though, were the racing was quite tricky because once you, after turn one, that was basically it. Another a car flew off into the distance and, and ended up winning. The qualifying was really impressive, and I think actually the time trial style qualifying was maybe a bit better than the race. But... I can't wait for Senegal in the next round because that's a proper rally style track. So there'll be a lot less dust. Mm. Um, so it was, it was really quite epic in my head. Um, I'll mention Liv um, and her comments as well, if that's OK. So she says that her stars for Extreme E were Andretti and the United drivers, uh, Katie and Timmy. Um Apparently, she drove a lap with her tire basically off on the rim and still got them into P2 that session. Um, oh, wow. And they beca- they came in P2 overall that weekend, uh, making it kind of a crazy race. It was a kind of a crazy race. I was watching it with my little brother, and uh, he was he was finding it mod- you know sort of moderately interesting as well, which is more than I can say for his attitude to Formula One. So they must have got something <laughs> right to keep an attention span of a six year old with extreme E. Yeah, it was one of those because I didn't actually watch um, the extreme E uh, race or qualifying. I was uh, just uh, sent the highlights and thought, right, got to concentrate, got to think of something important and in- insightful to say. Uh, come and you came up with you uh, <laughs> recording. And all I could think of though was this just reminds me of pod racing from Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> like the desert, the sort of <laughs> noise. <laughs> I just thought this is Star Wars: Phantom Menace and Anakin Skywalker's leading. You know, well done. We're going to see a three-headed squid or whatever saying, "And he's won the race." But um, <laughs> right. but no, it was it was very interesting, very chaotic. But um, I could not get uh, get uh, pod pod racing out of my mind when I was seeing that. Maybe that was because it was in the desert, but um, I suppose next time when we're at an actual ruddy circuit, I will uh, I'll maybe have a different view. So, yeah, it's a very interesting concept, this series. I sort of, I take, I do take a, whilst the, admittedly I did not watch it, I do take a, a bit of an interest, because I consider myself a, a, a motorsport fan, because I, I mean, less avidly, less avidly than I, I used to be, because I remember back in the day when I was a bit younger, I used to consume not just Formula One, but also World Rally Championship. I used to be a big fan of British touring cars as well. I used to watch that whenever that was on. Um, and MotoGP as well, I used to follow religiously. Um, so I, I, like, I'm always interested to hear about other motorsport news. Um, so yes, yeah, it's, it's a very interesting concept. I love I love the, the whole environmentally friendly uh, aspect to it and how they're they're raising awareness by going to um, <clears throat> different locations around the world at like different sort of beauty spots. Um, for example, so their calendars, this so this first round was in Saudi Arabia in the desert. As Tristan said, they're next going to the Senegal. And then the, the uh, other three rounds are in Greenland, uh, Brazil, and then Ushuaia, which is uh, right at the bottom of Argentina. It's like the port uh, which gives you access to the Falkland Islands. So some beauty, some stunning areas of the world they're going to. Um, and also the fact that they have... Um, they st- have put all the cars um, and basically their whole paddock on just a cruise ship and just travel around the world uh, between locations, which I think is really cool, actually. And, and I hear it uh, saves, well, it would it would save um, carbon emissions instead of, for example, the Formula One paddock, which flies everywhere. Um, so I rate the environmentally friendly aspect of it. I think that's a, that's a fantastic initiative. Um, call me a traditionalist. I am still... I guess you could say I'm still a fan of this, the series with combustion engines. I still, in terms of stuff with Extreme E and Formula E, I do accept that in, I can't, wouldn't put a timeline on it, but at some point in our lifetimes, um, Formula One will probably die a death. Um, this podcast might become Formula E in review or Extreme E in review in the future. I was thinking um, that maybe we just become racing review. <laughs> Yeah, it it could literally be that. You, you could we could either see a scenario where Formula One just dies a death, or it, it, like, it moves that, on moves sorry. on to hybrid. Yeah, I think possibly. they said that they're going to synthetic fuels. So I believe we will still yes. have. Eventually, we just have like two stroke, uh, single cylinder cars with a whopping great battery. People will be going, yeah. oh, I miss the V6 era, <laughs> where it's going like a moped. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Literally, to be fair, with 